Before we get started on axons, what do we say if we were to draw, if I was to draw a neuron, what type of neuron would this be? How, how do we classify neurons? Two categories or two classifications. What's one of them? We can classify them based on their structure, structure or we can classify them based on their function. function. Do we have any clue what the function of this neuron is? No. So let's classify it by structure. What type of neuron is that? Why is it multipolar? Because it has multiple um, dendrites. What are those called? Things that come off of the cell body? What are they called? They're, those are dendrites, but they're well, dendrites and axons together are called processes. Okay? So a multipolar neuron has multiple processes that come off of the cell body. Okay? What is this thing? The axon. The axon. So what would this area in red be? The axon hillock. Hillock, right? These are, what are those? Den, are you asking me or are you telling me? Dendrites, hope, right, dendrites. Okay, and then over here, that would be the axon terminus. What is this whole thing called? The cell body. Give me another name for the cell body. The soma, okay, good. What do we know about neurons? They're excitable. They're excitable. Okay, great. What does that mean? They right, they can be stimulus, stimulated. Stimulated? Stimulated? No, stimulated. Okay, what else? What else do we know about neurons? What don't they do? They, they don't grow and they don't divide. Okay, they don't undergo mitosis. But in some cases, in some cases you'll get a cut somewhere, you'll get an injury where our lovely neuron is, or axon, is broken. Then what happens? Right? Most of the cell body is still there, okay? No neurons do not replicate or grow back or regenerate as a whole, if this whole neuron died, it wouldn't go back. But the whole neuron's not dead, okay? The axon's been broken, so the portion of that axon can actually be regenerated. So the axon can be regenerated. Let's talk about axon regeneration, okay? So after traumatic injuries, right? Uh, cuts, broken bones, you name it, all right? Peripheral axons can regenerate. This does not necessarily happen in the central nervous system, okay? You get a central nervous system injury that kills or breaks axons. It does not happen, right? If it does, it is extremely long, okay? And it, it is possible, but unlikely that this happens in the central nervous system. But in the peripheral nervous system, the axons can regenerate. This is possible if this neuron cell body is still present, okay? And enough of the neural lemma. What's the neural lemma? All together now. It's what? I'm, seeing, I'm hearing one person talk. What did I tell you on Tuesday, people? Start. Start talking back to me or else I'm shutting all the computers. Personally. <laughs> With authority. No. What, what's the neural lemma? The cell membrane of the neuron. Okay, so if enough of the cell membrane's there and enough of the axon and the cell body is there, the, neck, the regeneration is possible. Okay? It's more successful if that amount of damage is not extensive. So the smaller the amount of damage, the more likely regeneration occurs. And the distance 
between the structures is smaller. Okay? The larger the distance, the longer time it's going to take, number one. Number two, the more likely it's not going to be successful. Okay? So what does neuron regeneration, what are the steps? Okay? So I just showed you the picture. Axon is severed by some type of trauma. So we cut the axon. All right? Proximal to the cut, okay, the axon wall seals off. So let's draw another multipolar neuron with the axon. That is an awful, awful axon. I'm sorry. Okay? And now let's cause this particular cut, okay? Proximal to the cut, the axon seals off and welds. So closer, proximal to the cut. Let's say it's closer to the cell body. So over here, it seals off and wells off, okay? Distal, the axon sheath de degenerates, but the neural lemma survives, right? So this piece goes away, right? But there's actually, the neural lemma is still there. And I'm just gonna draw it as dots. Okay, that survives. Okay? So now from there, the left, what's left over of the neural lemma and what's outside of the neural lemma, the endoneurium, form a regeneration tube. So it forms this kind of tube, this cylinder, that is going to guide where that axon's going to go, okay? Neurolemocytes, what are neurolemocytes? What's another word for neurolemocytes? Mm, no, sites mean cells. What are neurolemocytes? <coughs> hmm? Cells that maintain neurons. They, yes, they are a glial cell, they, cells that, neurolemocytes. What, what did we say? Go back and look at your neuroglial cells. There's one particular, and we're in the peripheral nervous system, there's one particular cell that are also known as neurolemocytes. First one with the answer gets a piece of candy on. Oh, there we go. Now we got some competition going on. <laughs> Mel's like, I, I'll answer now, Schwan. <laughs> candy on Tuesday. All right, Schwann cells. What do we know what Schwann cells do? They, they actually form, right, the myelin sheath. Okay, so now these neurolemocytes are going to, they help form, they, they're on the outside of that, uh, uh, they're on the outside of this uh, axon, and I'll draw them like that so you can actually see them a little bit better, right? There's your neural lemocytes in yellow, okay? <clears throat> so those neural lemocytes, they secrete nerve growth factors. So they secrete the factors and they'll actually, the axon will start to grow towards along where those growth, growth factors are produced, okay? <clears throat> mm -hmm. So the light blue, okay, right here, is the, the tube, the regeneration tube. The yellow line and the yellow shading, those are your neural lemocytes. I did not put in the growth factor. Okay. Okay? But now the axon will kind of follow the path that's la been laid before it and eventually will re the same effector that it was attached to before, whether it's muscle, a gland, you name it, okay? So if this were a motor neuron that was severed, okay, it would eventually reach down to a muscle, okay, and here we'd have, we'd have our axon terminus, right, and our axon would regrow and be regenerated. And then now that muscle cell would have the same innervation.
that can be a long, involved process. Here's your strep, your steps again, right? Trauma severs the neuron, okay? Your endoneurium is present within the, the you have the neural lemma that's inside of that, right? In this case, the Schwann cell was, was uh, killed off, right? This is going to a motor neuron going to a skeletal muscle. The proximal portion seals off. Everything else behind that dies off, right? There's still part of the neural lemma is present, okay? The endoneurium form your re regeneration tube is basically giving you like a little tunnel that the axon is gonna follow and where those nerve growth factors can be and the axon will regrow in that same, uh, in its same path, eventually innervating the same effector muscle that it was. So the, the neuron didn't grow back, didn't replicate, you didn't grow a new neuron, but the portion of the neuron that was damaged did grow back, right? So it, the axon regenerated. If we were to damage the cell body, that would kill off the neuron and we wouldn't grow that back, okay? But if we damage this neuron, it's possible, okay, that the presynaptic neuron that would actually terminate on this particular motor neuron might grow in its space, eventually getting down to the muscle cell, okay? In the central nervous system, the regeneration of axons is extremely limited. Your oligodendrocytes, all right, they actually secrete growth-inhibiting molecules, not growth factors, all right? Because there's large amounts of axons that crowd in there. We don't want to grow them back and have them go have wires cross the wrong way, right? And regrowth is then obstructed by scarring, right? Especially from those astrocytes. So when you have a traumatic brain injury that causes you know, neurons to die, that is not, or axons to, to die, that is not really a uh, regeneration that can occur there, okay? If so. you, so like when somebody has a stroke, they have it in a certain part of their brain. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes you can have lasting effects like mm -hmm. with your speech, yes. say. So that's because of those neurons dying. So yes and no, okay? Because you have limited capacity to make new neurons, but you can make new connections. Right. So if someone has a stroke, they lose capacity, they, start, they lose you know, maybe facial features, okay? Those neurons, if they die in the, in, the, in the brain, they're not coming back. But you can make new connections to the same. Which is why you can regain speech. Which is why you can regain speech. And so you're not necessarily, those neurons aren't coming back, you're not going from the same area or the same exact neurons that were, but there's plenty of other neurons, there are other neurons that are kind of latent that also um, innervate that muscle. And so those muscles can, can compensate for the ones that are no longer innervated. Okay, questions on axon. That covers the anatomy of neurons and the nervous system, the microscopic anatomy of the nervous system, okay? Now we're gonna get into neurophysiology. We're gonna talk how action potentials and how neurons work, okay? And to talk about that and to understand that, you need to understand some of the players that help achieve the, uh, the resting membrane potential of neurons, okay? We're gonna talk about pumps and channels. We already talked about pumps and channels when we talked about muscle. What does a pump do? Okay, it, it releases something, how? Does it just kind of, do I just open the door and let it go? It pushes it out. It's an active thing, right? As opposed to a channel, it's more of, eh, just kind of let it go, right? It's passive, okay? So, difference. So, pumps are membrane proteins that help maintain a concentration gradient. And this is an active process. 
By active, what do I mean? What am I referring to? We have ATP is being hydrolyzed and used. Okay? There's your cellular energy, ATP. Okay? Neurons have sodium potassium pumps and calcium pumps in their membranes. Okay? So, sodium potassium pump, does that sound familiar? Mm -hmm. Yes, it does. All right? Same thing, all right? Or a similar protein that we have in muscles that is going to help maintain the concentration gradient in and out. Okay? And then calcium pump in their membrane is, is important for producing a concentration gradient at the, especially at the axon terminus. Okay? Channels. Channels are pores in the membrane that allow ions to move down their concentration gradient in or out of the cell, depending upon what's more, right, where it is. Couple different channels. We already talked about the bottom two ones when we talked about muscle. We have chemically or ligand-gated channels. Give me an example on a muscle cell of a ligand ga gated channel. Winner, get, winner gets candy on Tuesday. I'm not afraid of bribery. I'm not. Come on, Brooke. On muscles. Is it sodium potassium channel? Where? It, it may be a sodium potassium channel, but which, give me an example, a specific example of a ligand gated channel. It's on the sarcolemma. All right, what's it called? It's on the sarcolemma, what's it called? So a ligand gated channel means something is going to bind to it, and that is then going to open the channel. To it, what's that? Well, that's where it is. Acetylcholine is released from the neuron and binds to what? The receptor. The receptor. And the receptor then does is what? The receptor is the channel. The acetylcholine receptor, right, is a ligand gated channel. It opens when it binds to acetylcholine. Okay? Voltage gated channels. What do they open in response to? The, the change in charge. The change in charge of what? The membrane potential. Okay? So the membrane potential is going to change and then they get flipped open. Okay? These other channels, the other ones we have up there, the leak passive channels, they're always open for continuous diffusion. Okay? So, we have a sodium potassium pump that's gonna move sodium out and potassium in in order to produce a concentration gradient, but it never reaches like too high. It's never, it never gets too high. Like if we never had a, a neuron being stimulated and that potassium, sodium potassium pump kept going, eventually all of, the potassium, all of the sodium that was in the cell is gonna be out of the cell and the potassium that was out of the cell is gonna be filled right inside the cell. We'll end up having too much. So there's always this leak channel, right? There's a potassium channel that leaks potassium out, so the sodium potassium pump keeps going, right? And there's a, a sodium channel that leaks sodium in, so it always keeps going. Think about your toilet. You flush the toilet, what happens? It fills up and it eventually stops, right? What happens if that float bubble in the back of the toilet isn't, doesn't go all the way up? What happens to the toilet just keeps running, right? It never actually fills up. That's what the, the purpose of the leak channel is. It never actually fills up all the way, so the sodium potassium pump is always kind of going, okay? And helps maintain that concentration gradient. Okay? So here's your tub types of pumps and channels, right? We have a resting, uh, a resting, at resting, this is a voltage-gated sodium channels. There's actually two gates to a sodium channel, okay? So it actually has like three different positions. When at rest, it's closed, okay? At this case, 
Sodium is higher outside of the cell than inside the cell. Then it opens, right? It gets activated, action potential comes down, it opens, sodium flows in, all right? So we go from closed, resting, to active, open, right? Goes through. Now we shut it off as um, a, this potential grows too high inside, and the inside gate closes, the inactivation gate, and prevents sodium from running back through, right? Or, or actually prevents more sodium from coming back in, or too much. So then it closes off and then it resets back to the resting channel. Okay, so it actually has a double gate. Okay. They are all voltage related. Okay. But the gate of the sodium is voltage. So there's your three states of the sodium channels, resting, activation, and inactivation state. Resting is closed. Right, activation is open, and then the inactivation state, okay, active one gate's open, but the second gate is closed and prevents sodium from continue, continually coming in. This lasts a very short period of time, the inactivation. It's kind of like the step right before resetting. <coughs> Back to resting state. Okay, modality gated channels. Well, what the hell does that mean? Okay, it basically means they're open in response to a stimulus other than chemical or voltage. So it's kind of like this wild card category. There's some other ways to open or close besides voltage and ligand, but these are few and far between. Okay, these are found in memories of, uh, membranes of sensory neurons, that change to changes in their environment, okay? Change, so we're gonna, they're like important receptors that are, are present in your body, okay? That we call mechanoreceptors or chemoreceptors, okay? Some of the skins of the, of, the, of the neurons of the skin are mechanically gated, okay? They're pressure receptors. So when you put too much pressure on the cell, it actually causes the gates to open, okay? You have them in your aorta, which are important to ma for maintaining blood pressure, right? Those are called baroreceptors, okay? All right, you have receptors in your aorta and your carotid artery that will open or close or change based upon the chemistry of your blood, whether oxygen's there or not, okay? Those are sent, but then they, they start an action potential and it goes from there, okay? These are less, I don't wanna say less important, but less important in terms of normal neuron physiology, okay? These are specialized, in other words. So, where are these pumps and channels? They are throughout the membrane of a neuron, okay? <clears throat> We have leak channels throughout the membrane. We have sodium potassium pumps throughout the membrane, right? The purpose of these two are to produce and maintain the resting membrane potential, okay? <coughs> sodium is gonna be high outside the cell and potassium is gonna be high inside the cell. So if this was our membrane, Okay, we have high sodium, low potassium. Inside here we'd have high potassium, low sodium. All right, and we have our pump that's gonna push sodium out and for every sodium out, we're going to move potassium in. Okay, that's the purpose of the pump. Now, we also have, I'll draw it like this, small. That's a potassium leak channel that will let potassium out. And we have a sodium leak channel 
that will let sodium in. Okay? That is going to always occur throughout the membrane to help, to help produce this resting membrane potential. And it's always going to be like more sodium outside than inside because um, I'm only doing, I'm only moving two potassiums for every three sodiums. Ah. Okay? So that's throughout the membrane. Now, throughout the whole neuron. But in different places of the neurons, we have different ch other channels. Okay, what we call functional segments have other channels or pumps. Okay, so a receptive segment, an area that's going to receive signals. What area of the neuron receives signals? The dendrites. So along the dendrites, you have chemically gated channels. Why are they chemically gated along the dendrites? Why would a dendrite need a chemically gated channel? Here's my neuron, right? Why would this dendrite need a chemically gated channel? Where's it going to get an information from? Area around it or a neuron before it, right? So what if there's a neuron that terminates right here? Why is it important that the dendrite, the postsynaptic neuron, have a chemically gated channel? Because when chemicals release from the synaptic, like in the synaptic cloud. All right, so this is a chemical synapse, a chemical separation, right? The electrical impulse is going to come down the presynaptic neuron and terminate at the axon terminus. How does it jump from this neuron to this neuron? Well, there's a chemical, a neurotransmitter that's released into the cleft and then binds to the receptor on the dendrite. So the dendrite has to have the receptor for that neurotransmitter. Though that receptor is a chemically gated channel. Okay? Understood? In the axon, is the axon receiving seg signals? Yes or no? Is the axon re going to have? No, it's not. So it's no point in producing and having chemically gated channels in the axon. OK? Just like there's probably less point to have a voltage-gated channel in the dendrite, OK? Example, chemically-gated chlorine channels, all right? The initial segment, or the axon hillock, has voltage-gated sodium channels and voltage-gated potassium channels, as does the conductive segment. All of the axon has voltage-gated sodium and potassium channels. Yes? OK, so we're talking about like a postsynaptic like neuron right now, right? Yes. So when we're talking about the neuron, we could plug, plug and play postsynaptic and push it into the presynaptic. We just move it from one thing to the other. The physiology in that particular neuron is going to be the same. Okay. okay? So if I'm talking about this neuron here, right, this axon, the direction of the signal is only going to go from the cell body down, right? So it's action potential is going to originate in its cell body somewhere. It's going to move down. The signal is going to jump over through here and now end up in the postsynaptic neuron and end up down this way. Oh, okay. It's never going. So now if I, was to, if I was to move the blue one for the black one, I'd still be talking about the same thing. OK? So all of the axon has voltage-gated sodium and potassium channels. And then the transmissive segment or the, the end point Okay, the axon terminus has voltage-gated calcium channels. 
okay? And calcium pumps. What happened in the neuromuscular junction in the motor neuron that stimulated the release of acetylcholine? When we went through those seven steps of, of what happens in the neuromuscular junction, action potential comes down to the axon terminus, then what? The voltage, voltage gated calcium channels open. So the, cha the channels open on the terminus of the neuron, and then what did that do? It stimulated the release of the neurotransmitter. Okay? So in this case, calcium is important, and those channels are open in order for release of the neurotransmitters into the synaptic cleft. Okay? So think about this if you can match the function of each part of the neuron and think about what they're doing, you can start to match the channels that are present. Okay, the axon channels are always going to work at propagating an action potential, and so the voltage gate is going is important for keeping that potential going in one. Okay, so here's a picture from your book showing you the distribution, receptive segment, chemically gated channels, right? And those are they 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 gave you one example of chlorine that could be potassium. It could also be um, a cation channel. Other channels that are the initial segment, voltage gated, the conductive segment, voltage gated, and then um, <clears throat> the entire neuron has the leak and the and sodium potassium pump, and the terminus has the, <clears throat> the transmissive segment has the voltage gated sodium uh, potassium, voltage gated calcium channels and the calcium pump, okay? Because calcium is going to be important in releasing the neurotransmitter into the synapse. Questions on pumps and channels and their functions? No. All right, because so we're getting into the thick of this. All right, and we're going to go from here. All right, a little bit of physics, just a little bit, a little bit, right? What we call Ohm's law. Voltage, current, resistance, etc. All right, because what we're talking about in terms of a nerve impulse or neuron impulse is an electrical impulse. And it's an electrical impulse is because the movement of these ions is going to carry with those ions carry charge, positive charge, negative charge, right? And so when you have higher charges on one side or more ions on one side than the other, you end up with a potential, a difference, okay? And once they start to move one place to another, that is electricity. That's all electricity is, a movement of, of electrons, movement of ions from one place to another. Okay? So a voltage is a potential energy. When we, when we measure the resting membrane potential, we, it is minus 70 millivolts voltage. That's potential energy. Okay? Current is the movement of charged particles across a barrier. Well, what are charged particles or ions? What are they moving across? The cell membrane as a barrier. So that's a current that can be moved, right? And then resistance. This is important, right? What is going to provide resistance or oppose the movement of those ions across the barrier? Well, the barrier and the channels, right? That's going to offer your resistance. Okay? When you increase the resistance, you lower the current. How do you increase the resistance in this case? <coughs> you could also think of current as like a flow of fluid, right? Yes? So when the channels open, how fast does the, the ions move? Faster or slower? Faster. Current there is then higher. I shut the channels, I offer more resistance, current goes down, right? When current goes down, voltage goes up. Okay? So, current is equal to the voltage divided by the resistance. Okay? Current increases with larger voltage, 
and smaller resistance. So by opening the channels, what happens to resistance? It gets smaller. Current goes high, right? <clears throat> so as applied to neurons, your charged particles are ions. The current is generated when those ions diffuse through the channels, okay? When everything is at rest, okay, current is low because leak channels are laying, letting things go. The potential energy is high because we have a big difference from outside to inside, right? And the resistance is high, okay? So voltage uh, exists, and the membrane offers resistance to the ion flow, right? And that changes. So when the channels open, resistance decreases, decreases, and eventually things move through, okay? So let's talk about neurons at rest. We, all, we already talked about muscles at rest, and they have what's called what? What is that potential across the membrane called? Well, the, at rest. Latent, Latent or resting membrane potential. Okay? For neur at neurons, it's about minus 70. In muscles, it's about minus 90. Okay? So what we're talking about when we talk about resting membrane potential is that there's a higher concentration of sodium ions, right, chlorine ions, and calcium ions outside the cell than inside the cell, right? IF refers to interstitial fluid. So outside versus in. And there's a higher concentration of potassium inside the cell, okay? But we have more sodium and calcium and chlorine outside the cell than we have inside the cell, so we have a, big, a bigger difference. That's what the minus 70 is, is the difference between them, okay? One inside, one outside, minus 70. That's the difference between outside and outside. So this kind of sums everything up at this point in time. What are the main players that will help produce your resting membrane potential? Sodium potassium pump and the sodium and potassium leak channels. They're found throughout the whole thing, okay? So at rest, here's your different segments. Receptive, initial, conductive, transmissive. You have all of those different channels, those uh, leak channels throughout, different places for the chemically gated channels versus the voltage gated channels. Inside the cell versus outside the cell is a minus 70 millivolt action potential. Okay. Eventually, this neuron is going to receive a stimulus, which is going to move that resting membrane potential up or down. Okay, it's either going to get, it's going to either going to go up or down depending upon the stimulus. So we have a stimulus that can move it up closer to threshold. We have stimuluses that can move them down and further away from from threshold. Okay. So here's interstitial fluid, plasma membrane, everything that's there. This is your resting membrane potential. Sodium, the leak channels and your sodium potassium pump. Okay? So if I asked you, name the, the resting membrane potential of neurons is achieved by which of the following groups of channels? Calcium channels, cal chemically gated calcium channels, Sodium leak channels, potassium leak channels, chemically gated, ligand gated potassium channels, or, and or ligand gated sodium channels. Tick tock, tick tock. No cahoots.
There you go. Answer the question. You have 30 seconds. Don't look it up. I want you to just think about it. It's like allowing us to pick the answers. Yeah. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. A, B, C, or D. Don't look it up, just think about it. 10 seconds. Four, three, two, one. Quick question, let's go, where's my report? Oh, it's not gonna come up. Whatever, it's fine. 75% of the class said, said C. The answer is C, why is it C? Leaky channels, right? at resting memory and potential. And I'm only looking at the, the channels that I asked for. What other thing is also important in producing the resting memory and potential that's not listed there? What pump? The sodium sodium potassium, potassium pump. Okay, so why not voltage gated channels? When do they open? When there's a change in, me in membrane potential, they're not open because we're at rest. Okay, the chem the ligand gated channels they're open when there's a ligand, and that actually helps it initiate an action potential. And calcium channels they're not re they're not related to the resting membrane potential. Okay, they're only found in the transmissive at the end. Okay, so your resting membrane potential. Diffusion of potassium is the most important factor in setting this. Potassium diffuses out, right, due to its concentration gradient. It's limited by the electrical chemical gradient, blah, 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 right? The pull of the negative RMP on the positive ion. Basically, it's saying that it, potassium is going to move out, okay, but it, because it's positive, the cell doesn't let it. Okay, if this was the only ion that was leaked out, then, we, then we'd be about minus 90. But sodium also leaks into the cell, right? There's more. What this also is saying is that potassium leaky potassium channels and leaky sodium channels are not necessarily equal in number, okay? There are more leaky potassium channels than there are leaky sodium channels. If there's more of the opportunity of these guys to flow out, okay, if more of those flow out, then holding them in is going to be more important in, in setting the resting membrane potential, okay? And a little bit of sodium that comes back in keeps the resting neuron potential a minus 70, okay? And then the last thing, neuron at rest, is the role of the sodium potassium pump. The pump pushes three out and only two in, okay? So this contributes about minus three volts of the minus 70 total, okay? But more importantly, it maintains the concentration gradient for the ion so that potassium will leak out through the leaky channels and sodium will leak in, which will set the resting membrane potential at minus 70, okay? At minus 70, that's neuron at rest. And then from there, we can, different stimuli will push closer to threshold or further away from threshold all right, and if they do that, eventually you hit threshold at minus 55, and then at minus 55, all of those voltage-gated sodium and potassium channels open, and we have an action potential that is produced, okay? We'll go through the action potential on Tuesday, okay? Um, read ahead through chapter 12. 
I will also be posting a, a neuro or nervous system homework uh, through Connect.